nutshell for the past three years, that's our demo reel for our company. My name is Amar D. It translates to Never Ending Life. So that's our company. We're a small company, we do documentaries. Um, some are good, some are tragic, some are... We pretty much feel all the emotions. But uh, this past month, I felt some weird emotions and a lot of things have happened. Some of you guys have known about it. The moment of silence was uh, for the temple that I grew up at in Wisconsin, where, um, let's call it, an um, unfortunate soul came in and decided to shoot up a church at 10 a.m. And my father was one of the victims. And uh, he's the president of the temple. He took all his money that he saved up and helped form a temple to help other Punjabi people and Indian people come to this country. Um, and he gave up that ghost that day. But it's not, a, it's not a sad story, because in our culture, we don't believe you die. We don't believe you end. We believe that you become one with the cosmos and you go in one current. There's a word we have called ikum God. It means one God, one current. So we're all on this little pebble of earth flying around this current. Um, so his energy sometimes comes down and up or whatever. Um, so having that background, I met a gentleman named Dr. Stephen Greer. And I met him through my studies of documentaries and other interesting stories, but mostly through science and technology. And it was a good meeting the first time we met. Uh, he, he gave me such a brain dump that I had to go home and like... <laughs> my wife can attest, I spent about four nights just studying on, online. What's going on? You might not know about this stuff. So, you know, we decided after a long while to make a documentary about his life and his 22 years of research and work and experience and experiential experience and um, it's been an amazing ride of, of the documentary thus far. I want to say a couple of things before I introduce Dr. Greer. Uh, two people really made this night happen uh, beyond you guys and all the other people who worked. The person who's running the AV is um, our assistant editor and she's been doing an amazing amount of work and a lot of stuff so I'd just like to give her a round of applause. Her name is Lori Knapp, and um, she came to us as an intern, but now has become a full-out, you know, assistant editor. And there might be some glitches up there. There might be times. <laughs> so bear with her, and everything will go smooth. And also, JD, who announced me coming on the stage, he's been the producer in charge, and he tried to help corral you guys in the best way without being too disrespectful based on security and based on other issues. So please give him a round of applause. <laughs> and without further ado, 22 years of experience, maybe more, we don't know how many lifetimes, right? <laughs> Boiled down to one night. I think this is an amazing night because when Dr. Greer talks, he has so much knowledge and information he drops a lot of names, he drops a lot of events, and without seeing an image, I don't think the human psyche can gather that info in one morsel. And so tonight is a special night, because he's about to do that for you guys. You're the first 520 people in the nation to see this, and um, I think we're all part of a very special evening. So without further ado, Dr. Stephen Greer. <laughs> Dr. 
Dr. Jan Bravo for helping me. Uh, and so I really want to thank all the people who have uh, made this possible, and most of all, you guys, because if it weren't for you guys, I wouldn't be here. All right. So this is a crowdfunded movie about the most important subject and the biggest story never told. And it's not going to be done except that we're going to do it all together. And so I really, from my heart, want to thank you. So a big round of applause for all you guys. Thank you. It's uh, several thousand hours of videos, documents, pictures, and material we're going to go through in two hours. All right? So, <laughs> what, the key thing I want you to understand is that if we understand and know ourselves, we will understand and know ETs. Because the total number of minds in the universe is one. So said Erwin Schrodinger a hundred years ago. So in reality, all the mysteries we think we don't know are folded within us. Because the quantum hologram that is the universe that's conscious and awake is within every single one of us. Now, we have now over 4,000 cases of extraterrestrial vehicles that have landed. Not four, not 40, 4,000. We have, in fact, 3,500 pilot cases where there's been radar confirmation, etc. We have over 5,000 documents from the U.S. government and hundreds of thousands of pages of documents from 14 countries that have opened their files since the Disclosure Project was launched 11 years ago. And yet, and yet, this isn't on CNN every night. <laughs> We're going to talk about why that is. But when you hear the full story of what has happened in this journey of the last 50 to 100 years of the, of the United States and the world that no one knows about, if you're going to first probably be irritated, and as Gloria Steinem once said, the truth will set you free. But first it'll piss you off. And, and so, we're, we're going to go through all of that, but in, when we're done, we're going to cover not just the information and the evidence, which is overwhelming, but the implications, the new energy systems, and most importantly, the science of the next thousand years, the science of consciousness. And this is really the big breakthrough that we should all be dealing with that no one's talking about yet, but we're going to cover it tonight. We have in the Disclosure Project 500 military intelligence corporate witnesses to ET and UFO events. And over the years, what I have learned from these very heroic men and women, over a hundred of whom have gone on videotape, is that the way this is managed has subverted the United States of America in, in the most daunting way. But not only that, it has subverted the progress of humanity for almost 100 years. So, I want you to understand that if you look at the ancient history, for example, of this, this is nothing new. I would say we have never been alone, and we will never be alone. But it's all been hush-hush. And if you look, you will see in the ancient materials, and you can put up some pictures of some artwork. And in one of, the, one of these pieces of art, you're going to see a beautiful, uh, and this is uh, hundreds of years old. So if we go to this one, here's Mother Mary. What's this behind her left shoulder? <laughs> this is from the, I believe, 1400s. We don't have the data. I'm going to show the whole thing. Maybe the video's not working. But anyway, this 
is the kind of thing that is in every culture and has been in every culture for literally thousands of years, from the Vedas with the Vimanas to the Nazca lines to, I don't know if we have any of these images as I'm speaking, anyway, maybe it's frozen, but can we have some images of these? And they're amazing images from all over the world. So what you're going to find is that if you study ancient history, and there was a series that I was in for a while called Ancient Aliens. And, <laughs> yeah, we just put that out. <laughs> the astonishing thing about this is that the evidence for the fact that the Earth has been visited for thousands of years is laying out in plain sight. And years ago, a guy who works for the CIA said to me, you know, Dr. Greer, it's all hidden in plain sight. We just don't want to draw attention to it. Set up a diversion. Keep people fat, keep them happy, keep them diverted. It's what he called bread and circus. Like in the Roman era, just throw the bread out to the people and keep them entertained with dribble and shock and nonsense. That's, unfortunately, the sort of thing that has taken the place of news and information. And so what we have to do as a people is say, all right, enough of that. That's interesting for like 30 seconds. But now it's time for us to get really serious and talk about why this is being kept so secret. And the issues are not just scientific and technological and financial, but they're theological, consciousness, and spiritual. They cross the whole gamut. And this is why if we begin to really study this, we'll understand that the disclosure of this information will have an effect in the world that will be beyond our wildest imagination, and it will happen in this generation today, here, now, in our lifespan. I take my word for this, because I'm just a country doctor from North Carolina. That's why I tell when I have to go to the Department of Defense and talk about this, but, uh, it's just, you know, that's, that's what I do. But, you know, Margaret Mead stated, there are identified flying objects, that is, there are hardcore cases, 20 to 30 percent in studies, for which there's no explanation. We can only imagine what purpose lies behind the activities of these quiet, harmlessly cruising objects that time and again approach the Earth. The most likely explanation, it seems to me, is that they are simply watching what we're up to. <laughs> If you look at the, 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 the first uh, CIA director, uh, a man named uh, uh, Roscoe Hillingheater, this is from 1947, and he, if you put this up here, it is time for the truth to be brought out. Behind the scenes, high-ranking Air Force officers are soberly concerned about the UFOs, but through official secrecy and ridicule, many citizens are led to believe the unknown flying objects are nonsense. Now notice here, official secrecy and ridicule. An Air Force officer told me a few years ago, it's really through the ridicule of the subject that this has been kept secret. Because people don't want to be called a kook or Governor Moonbeam. <laughs> All right, or what have you. But the truth is, is that this is taken very, very seriously in scientific and very senior uh, circles. Most, many of our presidents have commented on this. Uh, and you have, you know, President Jimmy Carter stated when he was running for president, if I become president, I will make every piece of information this country has about UFO sightings available to the public and the scientists. And I am convinced that UFOs exist because I have seen one. Don't take my word for it. We have General Nathan Twining, the commanding general of the Air Material Command, who wrote the following. It is my opinion that the phenomenon reported is real and not visionary or fictitious. There are objects probably approximately in the shape of a disk of such appreciable size as to appear to be as large as man-made aircraft. <laughs> we'll get into that. There's a possibility that some of the incidents may be caused by natural phenomena, such as meteors. However, <laughs> the reported operating characteristics, such as extreme rates of climb, maneuverability, particularly roll, and action, which must be considered evasive when sighted or contacted, 
lead, lend belief to the possibility that some of the objects are controlled either manually, automatically, or remotely. The uh, CIA director from 1950 said, the CIA has reviewed the current situation concerning the unidentified flying objects, which have created extensive speculation in the press and have been the subject of concern to government organizations. And it goes on and on and on. What you find when you look at all of these people dating from the World War II period to today is that, yes, it is the subject of a lot of jokes and it's the subject of a lot of Hollywood movies. But what I've met with people at the Pentagon, the CIA, and Congress is taken very seriously. However, from 1955 to now, what happened is that this whole subject got taken out of the chain of command of the people who you think are running the United States government, the government of the United Kingdom, and France, and all the other nations on the planet. And this is a situation which, when you look at the history, creates a major, major problem in governance and how we're going to go forward as a civilization. When we began to collect some of these witnesses, some of them came forward and said, you know, I don't know if anyone's going to believe this, but if you look and uh, just play this clip from uh, Callahan. And John Callahan, while they're setting that up, was the third highest ranking man at the FAA. And it was during the Reagan years. And there was a massive ET craft over Alaska. Tracked on radar, seen by Japan Airlines pilot, 747 guy, who reported it. Jets were scrambled. And he had all of this data that came in to the Accidents and Investigations Division of the FAA. John Callahan, who's one of 500 of these top secret guys who were at a briefing with Reagan science advisor, a guy, three guys from the CIA and the FBI, said that those guys were very interested in this. And he set up a briefing in a situation room. At the end of it, the CIA guy said, well, this meeting never happened. This event didn't happen, and we're confiscating all these files. All of it. And he says, oh, yes, sir, yes, sir. Handed all over boxes and boxes of data, which we, I have in my archive. <laughs> <laughs> because what John Callahan did is that he didn't tell them that the originals were still in his office, and when he retired, he came forward as a whistleblower and a patriot and gave them to the Disclosure Project. So let's listen to what he had to say. I think that's the way the government wants the outside people to view the kooks and not wrapped too tight and you got to watch out for them. That's the image that they put out. Uh, I guess I really don't care about the image. But what I can tell you is when I see them with my own eyes, and I said, I've got a videotape, I've got the, a lot, I've got the voice tape, I've got uh, 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 the, the reports that were filed that will uh, confirm what I've been telling you. And I said, I'm one of those what you would call the high government official in the FAA. I was a division chief. Uh, it was only three or four down from the Admiral. <laughs> Now, the Disclosure Project now has hundreds of hours of this kind of testimony with the backup documents. And what I would encourage you to do is, is to look at that material. One of the things that I want to share are some of the uh, important testimony from other witnesses uh, and people who come forward over the years. For example, uh, when Gordon Cooper came forward, Many people couldn't believe a, a Mercury astronaut would come forward with information about an ET craft that landed in 1956 at Edwards Air Force Base on the Dry Lake Bit. And we have his testimony. And he's now passed away. But a few years ago, when I was giving a talk at the Federalist Society in Washington, a very conservative group concerned about the Constitution and all of that, he was there with me. We were invited to speak. And this was after I had done a lot of briefings for the Clinton administration and what have you. I was shuttling from North Carolina up to D.C., doing all this stuff, working as my day job, being an emergency doctor, doing this as a volunteer, trying to fix an enormous problem. 
And Gordon Cooper said to me, you know, the Secretary of Defense, Cohen, asked to see the materials from this landing. I said, well, I put it on a general's plane and we flew it back to Washington. So he gave the Secretary of Defense of the United States of America the dates and all the information for this event that he personally had seen. And the Secretary of Defense, Cohen, William Cohen, got back to him and said, it's missing, we can't find it. It's in the black pit of Calcutta. And Gordon Cooper, at one level, couldn't believe that the Secretary of Defense could not get this sort of information. And he said, is that really true? I said, yes, sir, because I have briefed the sitting director of the CIA, who has also denied access to these files. So he said, well, who the hell has access? I said, that's a long story. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> and we will. Now, I'd like to be able to also share with you the fact that in addition to all of these witnesses, there are all these government documents. And I want to just go through a couple of them. I'm not going to read you. You can see these on, uh, in, in, in various websites. But it's just to give you an idea. The first one I want to give you is the one that I put. Unfortunately, I didn't have that document when I uh, did the briefing for the CIA director and Bill Clinton. Uh, but by the time Obama got elected, I got a few more little goodies. <laughs> and this document, National Reconnaissance Office, dated 1991. Now remember, Project Blue Book was closed in 1969. Government's not doing anything with this stuff. And this is a memorandum from the National Reconnaissance Office, which is the super secret spy agency, talking about a security breach by some Skywatch people going to Nellis Air Force Base, what the public would call Area 51, no one in the business calls it that. But in this document are the distribution <coughs> names, and what I want to point out to, the, to all of you, look at this, Cosmic Ops, Madge Ops, Magi Ops, Majestic. Mm -hmm. This is a code name started in the 40s. But this is, it has the code numbers and all the things. And the, look at this, Pahoot Mesa, Sally Carter, Groom Lake, Dreamland, MOC, Military Operating Center, Ground Star, Blackjack Team, Blackjack Control is at Edwards. And on and on and on. Now, this document, some debunkers just, oh, well, you know, wasn't declassified, so it's not real, it is real. Um, when I got it to an admiral who is in charge of intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff, J2, the head of intelligence joint staff, Admiral <coughs> Wilson, he got this document, he looked at it, and this was sent to him before my stand-up briefing I did with him. I brought Edgar, Edgar Mitchell, the astronaut Edgar Mitchell, six men on the moon, with me. And when he made an inquiry about one of these compartmented projects. We'll get into this in a moment. He recognized one of them. He didn't know what was in it. So he contacted a contractor, the Beltway Bandits, where all the 100 to 200 billion a year goes missing. We'll get into this in a moment. And he said, hello, I'm Admiral Wilson, Head of Intelligence, Joint Chiefs of Staff. I would like to be read into or briefed on this project. And they said, yes, sir, we know who you are you do not have a need to know. He said, damn it, how can I not have the need to know? I'm the head of intelligence with the Joint Chiefs of Staff. They said, sir, we cannot discuss this with you further. And click, cut the line, blocked him. This, of a man of that stature. Now, I can tell you a dozen stories like that. And the reason that is so significant is because when you understand why the secrecy exists, you understand <coughs> the reason behind these extreme measures. It isn't because the subject is silly. They want you to think that. It's because it's so profound. Another document, let's go back a few decades, from Canada. This accidentally got declassified as top secret. Um, and it was uh, from Wilbur Smith. And he was uh, with the Canadian government. And he had a very interesting, uh, you can pull that up, and Again, this is one of several tens of thousands of documents, but I find it an interesting one. Because look at the date on it, November 1950. 
I was in a twinkle in my father's eye. Most of you weren't. And if you look on page two, it says, the matter is the most highly classified subject in the United States government, rating higher even than the H-bomb. We had not detonated the first hydrogen bomb yet. Flying saucers exist, period. No. And then C, their modus operandi is unknown, but concentrated effort is being made by a small group headed by Dr. Benavar Bush. This is the man who headed up the Manhattan Project that developed the atomic bomb that we dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The entire matter is considered to be the United, United States authorities to be of tremendous significance, and it goes on. I have a whole book of stuff from this man, Wilbur Smith. And so then you begin to realize, gee, I wonder, you know, if there are this many smoking gun documents, what kind of things are out there that maybe haven't been released? Well, I have a few thousand of them. <laughs> now, I want to say something here to make a distinction between what DisclosureProject.org is doing and people who just go in and hack a computer. The only things we released are from projects that we can prove in a court of law are illegal and criminal. Let me be very clear on this. These are not things that are being classified and kept secret according to approval processes that are required by the Constitution of this or any other country that would allow, say, a president or a Senate Intelligence Committee, Oversight Committee, any other entity of the government to have full knowledge of it and classify it or declassify it. These are projects that are running under the radar. And as soon as they went under the radar and went off the reservation in 1956, when the Rockefeller Commission, headed up by Nelson Rockefeller, reorganized the Department of Defense and reorganized the CIA, from that date forward, no U.S. President, no Senate Committee, and most of the senior flag officers, generals, admirals, who have been in the Pentagon, have been blocked access unless they were part of this compartmented operation and would go along with the secrecy. That is illegal. We're going to talk about this in a moment, the difference between misguided secrecy and illegal secrecy. Secrecy that runs afoul of the Constitution and the rule of law. And that is what is destroying the planet because it is delayed for 60 years. You and me and our children and our grandchildren having free energy, anti-gravity, clean environment, no poverty, and a just and prosperous planet. <coughs> All right? Yeah. Now, because I'm here in Los Angeles, and it's the 50th anniversary of a beautiful lady, a passing named Marilyn Monroe, Right name Marilyn Monroe was. Um, I want to have a document here. Now, this is the kind of thing I get fairly routinely. And this is a top secret document. It has not been declassified. It's been authenticated by a man who used to be General Odom's right hand man, the head of the National Security Agency, who now is a lecturer at the University of Maryland, and who wishes to remain confidential. So I got this document from someone whose family was at the beginnings of the National Security Agency, NSA. And in it, it's a wiretap. And the agency, the CIA, was tapping Marilyn Monroe's phone. And in the process, she was on the phone because she was frustrated at having kind of been dropped by the Kennedy brothers. Um, and she was going to tell the public in a big press conference the whole world would have listened to this one, about what Kennedy had told her. And if you read, look at this, about the objects from New Mexico, from outer space, and this spacecraft with the dead bodies, this is going on and on. This is about Roswell. It is a smoking gun. Project, it has Project Moondust, Project 46, and look at the signature, James Jesus Angleton the third. 
He was the chief mole hunter who stopped leaks at the CIA at this period. And this was Marilyn Monroe's death warrant. But what happened was that they, she was going to do this press conference. And so they made it look like a suicide, and they killed her. I also have someone who won't come forward, who way back then was in the intelligence unit of the LA Police Department, operated this was going on. You have to ask the question then, what exactly is so key about this that they would do that kind of extreme measure to someone who was fairly innocent? She was an innocent bystander who learned something and she was going to talk about it. This is the $600 trillion question. And that's really what I want to get into at this point is what's really behind the secrecy. So when you look at all these documents, what you begin to realize is that the secrecy has to more to do with macroeconomic power than it does national security. Now you can conflate these two things. We're going to get into this in a moment. And that's why these extreme measures would be taken. Now many people have said, well, is there any other evidence? I have a family member, who I won't name, who is the city editor of a major northeastern newspaper, mainstream. And she said, I don't care if you put a dead ET on my desk, we wouldn't cover this, because this is the stuff of the National Enquirer and rubbish. I said, okay, <laughs> fine. And at that time, I really didn't have a dead body <laughs> to put on her desk. Now maybe we do. I'm going to show you some pictures of a little creature. Tragic story, but and if you're squeamish, turn your heads away. Um, this came to us uh, in the last couple of years, and there was a man who runs an institute in another country that I cannot talk about. But he came into possession of a little creature, and it was a baby, or a neonatal, creature. It is humanoid. It does not look human. Um, it has a head, two arms, two legs, a torso, etc. But that's about where it ends. And I want to point out some things here about this. This is what all of you have heard that we're in the process of investigating. This is one of a couple dozen major cases. And Thankfully, there are some people who come forward who are some of the most brilliant geneticists and scientists in the United States who are associated with various Ivy League universities who are going to do the genetic testing on this for us. Thank you very much. You know who you are. And I want to come to this picture for a moment. Um, you can probably see it better than I can because the lights are blinding me here. But if we can look at this one, um, can you, you can isolate it. Okay, so can everyone see this? Yeah. All right, so you can see, oh, look at the arms. They're so long that if you stretch them out, they come down below the knees. And when I put my arms down, it's halfway to the thigh. Four skull bones, has ten ribs, has a, a no sternum, breast bone. It has a very, very long neck. And look at the size of the cranium from the eyes up. And look at the person next to you. <laughs> All right? Three to four times the size of our cranial ball. Well, uh, you know, my sense of having had contact with, with these kind of species is that their IQs are in the four to five hundred range. So I'm an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so this is me holding it. And you can see that the, the, the bean. It's like how small? It's about six, eight inches. Um, and do we have to, can you hit this and get to the pictures of the, um, the x-rays? And... Hello? Hello? I want to show some uh, other features. Um, it's not working? I think you have to hit this or something. All right, there we go. I think I just woke someone. <laughs> um, sorry. But look, look at the internal. 
internal structure. Now, what we're going to do in the next few weeks is get an MRI of this, a really good MRI, and some other x-rays. Um, we'll just go on to the next ones. And, um, <coughs> next. I, I apologize, but I, I have no control over this stuff. Um, no, it's a different case altogether. Um, I, I apologize. Can we get these pictures back up? I call this EB. It stands for Extraterrestrial Biological Entity. And what's fascinating about this beam is that when you look at it, I was only the third person ever to hold it. It's a biological organism, number one. This is not plaster of Paris. Um, it's